How's everybody doing? Good. How are you? I'm doing good. I've never been to North Carolina. This is my first time in the state. And uh, I was talking to some students earlier today that the only reference I have to North Carolina other than Michael Jordan playing for the Tar Heels is the movie The Wood. Do you know the wood? Yeah. Which, which Luke said, Luke actually said that it is a horrible representation of North Carolina as a state. Terrible accents. Terrible accents, but that's being from the West Coast, being from Southeast LA, just west of South Central Los Angeles. That was like one of the only references we had to North Carolina. So I apologize for that bad <laughs> connection. But um, I want to give thanks to Luke for bringing me out to, across the country to do this talk. It's always exciting to share my work with folks because that's what I that's why I do what I do. And the entire office of uh, multicultural affairs. I used to do similar work as as Luke, so I know that that work is not easy. And so, you know, everybody that's here, all the students, all the teachers, all the faculty members and administrators, you know, you know definitely recognize the work that they're doing because they're doing some beautiful work for the students and, and supporting them and challenging them and making them uh, critical thinkers and well-rounded individuals. So, uh, Rudy Mondragon, these are my pictures. So when I go to the fields, damn, my voice just changed. It's time, for, it's time to lecture. I'm ready. So these are pictures I take. I, every time I step into the field, which consists of boxing gyms and sports arenas, when I get media passes from top ranked sports, from Golden Boy promotions, from premier boxing championships, I take my camera. I shoot with a 70D camera and a 35 millimeter lens and I try to capture the things that I see so that I could better show and represent my work. And so there's a drama to it as Luke, um, you know, shared the title with y'all, is a quote from this promoter called Lou DiBella. And Lou DiBella's from New York, a Harvard grad, and Lou DiBella says that boxing is theater. If it's not theater, then you're fucking up and presenting it. Not my words, his words. So that's what this whole idea of there's a drama to it, there's a performative element to it. It has to be entertaining, otherwise no one's gonna watch the fights. And so before the fight actually takes place, there has to be some kind of theatrical narrative or script that gets written so that Jose Ramirez here can fight against someone else so that people will buy into the idea of the fight. And so I gave my thanks and now let's, um, let's move on. Um, so I firmly believe that in my website, if you ever go to my website, rudymondragon.com, you'll see that I have this quote, and the quote basically says that I believe that everybody has a personal story when it comes to boxing, whether it's good or bad. And I think boxing provides us with an optic to not just study society, but boxing is society. Boxing can be analyzed, interpreted, power dynamics, race. There's this documentary on Netflix called, uh, it's a series called um, Ugly Delicious. Have y'all ever heard of it? Ugly Delicious, no, yes? You've heard of it? It's basically exploration of food. And there's this guy named Arellano, Gilberto Arellano, who's uh, famous for this thing called Ask a Mexican. But they ask him for his expertise on this idea of food and he says the taco is immigration. The taco is race. The taco is labor. The taco is culture. The taco is family. And that's always, that's always like, I've always related that to my work because boxing and sports is not just sports and it's not just entertainment, but you can examine gender issues. You can examine race issues. You can examine a plethora of things. And so for me and my research, boxing has become the optic, the site that I use to study uh, social issues and cultural uh, histories. So my story with boxing. <laughs> That's me, huh? That's sweater. With the turtleneck. <laughs> and uh, I want to say that might be the logo of the, like, the Saints. The Saints, it might not be, but it looks upside down. But it might be Cactus. <laughs> I don't know what it is. But that's a picture I took uh, in, I think, one of my elementary uh, years. I was seven years old when this picture was taken, which is perfect because that was the same year, 1992. Hurry up and do the math. I'll help you out. I'm 33 years old. I was seven years old when 1992 hit, uh, or 1990, before December. I was, this, is, this is taken in the fall. So I was seven years old here. And this was the year my dad took me to my first ever boxing match. Not to the actual venue for it, but he took me to my Uncle Felipe's house. 
And my Uncle Felipe, the reason why we went to his house is because he was the only member in our family that had a black box. Does anybody know what a black box is? Y'all are too young to know what a black box is. What? Is that cable? Yeah, but it's like bootleg cable. Oh. Now you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. So, so my uncle used to bootleg his cable. He knew a cable guy. He ran a cable. He got a black box. And all the pay-per-views we wanted from wrestling to boxing, we got for free. <laughs> before the fire stick, before hacking, before streaming things online, we had the black box. And so the black box was how we watched the fights. And so we went to my Uncle Felipe's house and we watched this guy. Does anybody know who that is? He's a Chippendales dancer. <laughs> this is Hector El Macho Camacho, 1992. He's the challenger. He's from Spanish Harlem and he's facing Julio Cesar Chavez, who is this marker of Mexican identity and manhood. But what stood out to me was this dude's ring entrance because the other ring entrance just didn't really speak to me. Even though I saw myself embodied in the Latinidad and the manhood of Cesar Chavez, which I don't picture here, but I picture him because this dude caught my eye. He entertained the audience. Who knows that song by McFadden and Whitehead, Ain't No Stopping Us Now. How does it go? How does it go? How does it go? <laughs> That's the song. <laughs> and so Macho, picture Macho, look, at this short little shorts with the slit on the side of his thighs. He's walking into the ring with this like Captain America thing. And he's like yelling with his gloves in the air, his entourage in the back, and he's selling Macho time, Macho time, Macho time. Macho in Spanish is like machismo or hypermasculinity. But it's also an empowered representation of, of masculinity when you think about the power dynamic between him and Chavez, because he was a challenger. He enters the ring first. Chavez enters the ring second, which is a very traditional thing to do in boxing because the challenger enters first and the champion enters second. He's announced second. And so I saw him as the underdog. And so ever since this, I've always really related to the underdog story in boxing. And I've always really rooted, not necessarily for the better boxer, because there's so many different dynamics when it comes to boxing. And so when he entered the ring, I knew that he wasn't the, the favorite to win. And he wasn't the more popular fighter. Because in that moment in the 90s, in 1992, it was Chavez. Chavez was the guy. Like everybody knows Mike Tyson, but in the other weight class, the so 140 division, it was Julio Cesar Chavez who this guy fought. Let's move it on, move it on. So here's the agenda for today. I want to share the focus of my research vision. I want to discuss the theor uh, theoretical and conceptual framework that guides my research, all the theories, the concepts. I want to show you all a ring entrance. I want to take you to the boxing ring. I want to break down the ring entrance, fashion politics, the soundscape, and the entourage, and then I'll give you my final thoughts. When I, when I say ring entrance, the ring entrance is like a runway. And so if you're a model, you're modeling clothes. You're expressing a certain st type of style. In boxing, you're presenting and expressing yourself. You're marketing yourself, you're letting the world know who you are, and in a way you're trying to also psychologically get in the head of your opponent. And so it's this beautiful site of struggle where I think is the most important place where boxers communicate their politics. And then these three things is what we call expressive culture. So a lot of the literature I draw from are from scholars who have talked about expressive culture. Expressive culture being the utilization of some type of cultural form, tradition, to communicate who you are, and also what informs the orchestrating of a ring entrance. We move to the present moment. Who's this? Eli Manning, good. Who said Eli Manning? No, come on, man. Who's that? Kaepernick. Colin Kaepernick from a Central Valley, California region, former 49ers quarterback. And this two years ago was the image that was cemented in the consciousness of sports fans, whether you agreed with him or not, it was all over the place. And as a sports scholar, I look at this and I think athletes are speaking. Athletes are not dumb individuals. Athletes have some kind of experience to share. And this is what Kaepernick's doing right here. 
But then I started thinking, because I studied boxing, is what Kaepernick was, is what he was doing happening in boxing? And when you ask people, when I ask folks, who do you think carried on the baton of Muhammad Ali? Can you name a boxer that has carried on the activism, the overt politics that Muhammad Ali would express in terms of not going to Vietnam because he didn't feel like this country represented the interests of black folks in America? Name one boxer that has followed in his footsteps, and we can't. And then my response to that question, which I ask myself, because I talk to myself all the time about the questions and the, 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 the boxing and the politics and why all this stuff matters, and I said, boxers are expressing themselves, but we need a different way of reading it. We need to ask different questions. We need to look at the ordinary. And the ordinary for me is the ring entrance. How many times, I don't know how many boxing fans we have in the house, so maybe if there's zero, I'll try to break it down as best as I can. But I would, I would, I would gamble and say that some of y'all in this room have debated who has had the best ring entrance in all of boxing, right? I know we've had that conversation. So names that go thrown out there, Roy Jones Jr., why? Because he wrapped his own song into the ring. Muhammad Ali, why? Because he was one of the first to use music when he entered the ring. Mike Tyson, why? Because he used to come into the sounds of chains, literally the sounds of chains to intimidate his opponents. All these are different orchestrations, engineering ring entrances to communicate some kind of message. So in boxing, what is required is an examination of what's happening in the ring entrance. These are photos of things that, these aren't my photos, but these are photos of things that have happened prior to someone's ring entrance or right immediately after the ring entrance. And so the photo in the middle is the most overt of the four, of the one, two, three, four. That's Oscar De La Hoya, the golden boy. He has a headband that says no to HR 4437. And for those that don't know what HR 4437 is, it's an anti-immigration bill that if passed would have made undocumented immigrants in this country felons. And at a federal level, a felony is equivalent to a rape charge, arson, or aggravated assault. Whether an undocumented person had committed a crime or not, they were automatically charged as felons if this had passed. And so Oscar de la Hoya, very subtly, but very clearly, communicated his stance on this very anti-immigrant bill. Raquel Miller, she had all these women join her into the ring while Beyonce's music was playing and they did the routine to the formation dance, I think it's called. And that was very famous during the formation tour, I believe it's called. So it takes time to really orchestrate these ring entrances. Tito Trinidad protested very clearly, peace for Vieques. During this moment in the early 90s, Puerto Rico, there was a heavy US Navy presence in Puerto Rico. And there had been this death in a major accident that prompted Tito Trinidad and his team, an Afro-Puerto Rican fighter, to say that we need US Navy occupation out of this territory that still belongs to the United States to this day. And then one of my favorites right here, Orlando Cruz, who a couple years ago became the first openly gay boxer in history in history to fight for a championship belt. And he enters the ring with not just the pride flag, but this is the pride flag mixed in with the Puerto Rico flag. So instead of the, the, the white, the red, and the blue, he has the pride colors right here to communicate this intersectional identity of sexuality, of race as an Afro-Puerto Rican, as a Puerto Rican from, based on his ethnicity, and he was very direct about that. Y'all you should, you should have seen his way, and he came in some like Speedos, really cool Speedos that had the pride colors on it too. And again, none of these athletes communicated a single word, which makes it a little difficult to see how resistance is taking place. So that's why I argue, as pawns in an unregulated sporting industry, 
the vast majority of boxers exist in a constant state of vulnerability, subject to the shifting market as well as the effects of dominant ideologies of race, gender, sexuality, and poverty. I argue that given their instability, expressive culture, particularly fashion, music, and an entourage become powerful tools for boxers to use during their ring entrance to communicate their politics and sometimes even perform resistance. What I call this, and based on my research and my now four years having done this, I call this sporting entitlements. Who knows who this is? Prince Nassim Hamed. He's a good example of how box, this boxer used to transform the boxing arena into a mosque. The takbir would play, signaling Muslims a moment of prayer. The entire arena responds to this young man who enters the ring with these leopard patterned trunks and on the back of it, it says Islam. Mind you, this is all happening before 9-11. And the question needs to be asked, had he existed post 9-11, would they even have let him express himself in that way? And of course, the answer is no. But this is what he was doing prior to 2001. And then Jorge Arce is just fun because he comes into the ring riding a freaking horse. <laughs> Pretty tight. So the ring entrance is this geography, this space of possibilities, endless possibilities. And sporting entitlements is what I define as ways in which professional boxers perform their multiple identities or subjectivities in subtle forms of resistance to dominant ideologies and structures of power through the deployment of expressive culture. Subtlety is critical given how boxing is highly unregulated and due to the widespread idea that athletes should shut up and play, in this case, shut up and fight. Boxing is the only sport that doesn't have a governing body to commission and to regulate it. Major League Baseball does, Major, National Football League, Major League Soccer, National Hockey League, etc. Boxers in California alone, for example, because boxing is regulated by the state and every state has different rules. California, for example, boxers are considered independent contractors. And there is no universal rule about minimum salary, healthcare, or a pension plan. So boxers are on their own. So let's say a boxer makes $50,000 for a fight when they're barely starting out, which is pretty high for your first professional fight. Usually boxers will make 12 to 20 Gs for one fight when they're first starting out, if they're lucky. From that, state, federal tax, if they're fighting in California or New York, for example. 10% for the manager, 10% for their trainers, and then all the expenses that go into their training camp. These dudes are left with peanuts, pennies. So that's why I argue of their vulnerability and instability and the shifting market. If they venture out of their lane, or what Immortal, Technique, tech, what Immortal Technique says, stay in your placism. If they don't stay in their place, they risk getting and securing their next contract or their next fight or their next opportunity to work. This is Jonathan Wally. He's one of the first boxers that I met during my research. And this is a photo I took of him at the Ten Goose Boxing Gym in Van Nuys, California. And I asked him, I said, why are you wearing a Black Lives Matter shirt? Not in a judgmental way. I was drawn to him. I wanted to understand why. And I said, why are you wearing that, bro? And he gave me a beautiful answer. If there's an issue, there's an issue. If you go into the doctor's office and you break, and you broke your arm, and he goes, oh, you broke your arm? Okay, well, let's see. Well, let me check your leg. Well, I don't need my leg checked out right now. All bones matter, right? They do. But if this one's broke, let's focus on this real quick. This guy has no formal education. He got into a fight with the sheriff's son, got locked up in YA, and did some time, and had all his basketball scholarships taken away from him. He was about to go to college and play ball. And he turns to boxing after he, he does time, his scholarships are taken away from him. No formal education. And this is the lived experience that informs this understanding of Black Lives Matter, of making race salient and addressing, addressing racial injustice issues. So boxers understand something, especially because a lot of them come from marginalized backgrounds. They have lived experiences to pedagogically show us and teach us. We just have to ask the right questions and we have to pay attention. 
Abner Marr is another photo I took. It's one of the cleanest boxers. Look at that line up and haircut and beard. I think he travels with his barber. I'm not joking. That's not a joke. I think he literally travels with his barber. All his Instagram posts are of his barbers. I'm like, Abner, you are the freshest boxer that I have ever seen. And this is what he shared with me. I ain't gonna lie. Boxing is a poor man's sport. When have you seen a rich man that likes to get hit? Yes, we have to go into the ring and with our fists show what we're made of. But I saw an opportunity to make something of myself, of my life, and get my family out of the hood. Abner Maris speaks to this vulnerability of poverty, of existing in constant instability when it comes to financial security. And for him, boxing, he hated boxing. His father got him into boxing. It was his father's dream for him to fight. And then after a while, he realized that he was good at it. And then he realized that this was a way for him to escape the conditions of poverty. Great guy. So this is my arsenal. All these are different scholars that I draw from. Infrapolitics by James Scott is what informed Robin D.G. Kelly, one of the best cultural historians on black history. He wrote Race Rebels. His work informed the work of my advisor. Shout out to Gay Teresa Johnson, one of the dopest cultural historians on spatial politics out there. She came up with this concept called spatial entitlements. And in Rebels, Louis Moore and Teresa Rustler are scholars who have just studied boxing and what they, they call rebels, boxing rebels, race rebels. This idea of the great almost white hope, which deals with multicultural liberalism, is something that I explore. In boxing and in sports, we're okay with black and brown athletes, as long as they stay in their lane. Once they diverge and start to go against the grain, i.e. Colin Kaepernick, then that's when we don't accept them. And then when we, say when we say we or them, it's those gatekeepers, those in power within these sporting industries or the media as well. Expressive culture is practiced and used via the ring entrance. And so here's an understanding of what I'm talking about. Infrapolitics, which is James Scott's concept, is basically acts of resistance that are intentionally subtle and disguised to keep vulnerable populations from being detected. When subjugated populations want to critique power, they're so vulnerable that if they speak out publicly, it can cost them their work, their livelihood, their reputation. So these forms of disguised resistance, James Scott says, are silent partners of louder forms of public resistance. They're not separated. They're in conversation with each other. By focusing on the hidden transcripts and infrapolitics and hidden transcripts is basically, public transcripts is what we see publicly. It's when we code switch, it's when we navigate for survival. Hidden transcripts is what happens behind closed doors, when you strategize, when you vent about those in power, when you try to cope with the conditions of power that are, uh, that are repressing communities and populations. And infrapolitics of, of African Americans, Kelly argues, was used to better understand vulnerable populations like poor and displaced working class black folks, and it requires a redefinition of politics and long-term historical perspectives that need to take place. And what he means by this is like, when we think about the NAACP or the Farm Workers Organization, or when we think about the Southern Christian leadership groups, or when we think about even Black Lives Matter, these are all formalized traditional forms of activism and institutions that carry out resistance. But Robin was like, what about black working class folks that are also on the everyday performing resistance? Like one of the examples he does and uses is by reading the transcripts of bus drivers. He found out that a lot of black um, patrons were accused by the bus drivers as making fun of them clowning them. And so Robin's like, look, one way to resist dominant society is to make fun of the white man. And that's what, he, that's what he found out. And he argues that that, in a way, is a critique of power. Because these buses would stop, take the money of a black patron, and say, you got to go into the back to get inside the bus. Once the guy goes through the back, the bus would just bounce, cheating them of their ride. And so these little ordinary spaces, these like things that people in the 90s weren't really looking at to examine resistance, Robin Kelly says that is where we need to start looking. 
and this is why I say for boxing, ring entrances in particular, we need to start looking at these things that we consider very ordinary, like that, it's nothing, that, that, that nothing's happening, because that's where we can really learn some things. And then spatial entitlements is what I also draw on from my concept of sporting entitlements, which is a way in which marginalized communities makes, make use of space. When you're in a space where, where it wasn't designed for you, you use the resources or the technologies and creatively refashion them so that you can claim a space of belonging, so that you can create temporary spaces of congregation. One example of how this happens in boxing is backyard boxing gyms. Backyards were not meant to house boxing gyms, but people take heavy bags, they take ropes from Home Depot, they take pads, whatever pads they can get, and they create a boxing ring in the back. It's kind of very similar to the punk rock scene in Los Angeles. Backyards aren't intended to be punk rock scenes, but punkers, do it anyway. The cops get called on them and then the space disappears. But for that tiny moment, black and brown punk rock kids get together to hold space and to congregate and be together. So boxing rebels. Louis Moore's book, he's, he draws from this cat called Howard Shodakoff. And Howard contends that this idea of bachelors during the Victorian era at the turn of the century um, did not ascribe to these Victorian notions of respectability. But majority of the writings and history texts were about white sporting um, uh, bachelors. And he's like, well, it's important to look at black boxers because he gives us this new understanding of what he calls a colored sport. And so he says, while black men often risk their lives frequenting white sporting spaces, which tended to be bars, um, pool halls and uh, places where sex uh, can be purchased. Colored sports created their own institutions, their own spaces at bars and billiard rooms to prove and affirm their manhood. Jack Johnson is a rebel, according to Teresa Runsteller, and as a rebel, she says, he traveled, he had to travel to other places outside the United States to just get a shot at landing a fight. For those that don't know who Jack Johnson is, in 1908, Jack Johnson becomes the first black heavyweight of the world, which at the time, in 1908, the heavyweight crown was the biggest sports accomplishment that you could achieve. It was bigger than baseball, basketball, football, like boxing was the sport to watch. And Jack Johnson, for a long time, nobody wanted to fight him. He would go to Europe and call out champions, and they wouldn't give him a, give him a shot because there was a huge risk uh, associated to, to fighting a black champion, uh, to, to fighting Jack Johnson or a black fighter. If you were a white man who gave a black fighter an opportunity to fight and you lost to that black fighter, the entire racial order of white supremacy would be rocked and disrupted. And so, so white fighters would say, I'm not gonna reduce myself to fighting a black man because we're just on different levels of civilization, right? Jack Johnson finally gets his shot in 1908. And he might not say that he was about the, the people. He might not say that he was fighting for equality. What he did was walk into the ring and he started blowing kisses to the people that would yell the N-word or coon the loudest. So he was mocking people. When he got in the ring, he kept telling his opponent, which I think was uh, Tommy Burns, he kept telling him to hit him right here, to hit him right here. And the reason for that was because during that era, there was this thing called scientific racism. And scientific racism basically said, white people have thinner skulls because they got big brains which means that they're smarter, they're more intellectual. Black folks have thicker skulls and small brains. So if you hit a black man in the face, it's not gonna really hit them or affect them because they got thick skulls. So you gotta hit them in the body. There was books that were published that said this kind of stuff. And so that's why Jack Johnson gets in the ring and tells his opponents, hit me right here, hit me right here. And they would hit him and they wouldn't phase him. And so in those, those small little demonstrations and those actions, He's presenting this resistance or this disruption to this mythology that was widespread during that time, that was informed by science. And in that, in that era, science was wrong. And Jack, Jack, Jack Johnson, by stepping into the ring, was disproving all that. And then Great Almost White Hopes is, again, what I was saying about 
liberal multiculturalism. And this idea comes from Jack London when Jack Johnson beats Burns in 1908, he, he coins this idea of the white hope. So the great white hope was this symbol of reclaiming the racial order reestablishing the social order of white supremacy and whiteness. And so Jack London, in his writing, he was a media, he was a, a writer for the newspaper, he said, we need a new white hope to emerge and dethrone Jack, Jack Johnson. But Jack Johnson was a champion for many, many years. So in the present moment, I, I think that great almost white hopes manifest because if, if, if black and brown athletes, especially in boxing, don't behave themselves or don't operate within the parameters of respectability and comfort, then they become easier to dispose and get rid of, right? When we think about Oscar De La Hoya, Sugar Ray Leonard, these were boxers who were recognized and, and as, as great champions, as gentlemen of the sport. Gentlemen oftentimes in boxing gets conflated or, or, or is like synonymous with whiteness. Whereas savagery or thuggery gets associated to a deviant uh, subjectivity of black and brown folks. So now I wanna show y'all a ring entrance. We'll watch this and then I'll kind of break it down for y'all. The top eight negotiation, Fernando Vargas will be entering the ring first and will be introduced last. Why the negotiation? Because of course, both fighters hold title belts at 154 pounds. Chavez. He's retired at this point. Once again, Julio Cesar Chavez. All right, there it is. At the end of the ring, just as he walks with Marcus, he entered the arena several hours ago. Chavez and Tommy Merchant pointed out a symbol to Mexican American and Mexican fans of Marcus's solidarity with his machismo heritage. on his cap, anybody recognize that? No? Damn, it doesn't exist anymore, but. This is a pay-per-view fight, so these are like, they invest more money to make the, the ring entrances more spectacular. up there. So let me break this down real quick. So I got to meet Fernando Vargas earlier this year for the first time and I was starstruck. But it's funny because I told him, I was like, when I used to watch you fight, especially when I watched this fight in 2002, I was like, I couldn't relate to you. I was a De La Hoya fan. I told him that. <laughs> a former boxer. I was like, I didn't really like you. And he, he responds, yeah, of course. You're a preppy. <laughs> You're a pretty boy. I was like, yes, yes I am. And the, so I, I explained to him, I was like, look, before I used to cheer for Oscar because Oscar, I related to him in the times of the early 2000s because I saw him as the example of assimilation. The golden boy. The golden boy is a historically used boxing name to signal the, the chosen one. And for me, I was like, well, I'm Mexican, I'm Mexican-American, I'm born in LA, he's born in East LA. You know, everybody loves him. 
you know, in the ring, the, the, the commentator describes Fernando Vargas as the, the hero or the, 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 the best example of machismo. So they look at him as this very hyper-masculine being. And, and when Oscar De La Hoya enters the ring, they describe him as, you know, just another day in the office for this businessman. So one has a white collar description, the other has a blue collar description. And so they humanized Oscar at the expense of Fernando Vargas, who and I'll, I'll get into it a little bit in terms of what I mean by that. But, you know, then I told Fernando, I was like, you know what? Now I see the value of what you brought to the table. And I was like, I put you in the same lineage as boxers such as Jack Johnson, Muhammad Ali, Mike Tyson, Floyd Mayweather, and you now. You're a rebel. And he loved that, of course. Fashion politics, the brand I was asking if y'all recognize is Dada. And I'll go into that in a little bit. But that's what he's sponsored by. So when I asked him, I was like, that's cool, you, you chose to wear Dada. And he's like, no, 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 I chose it, but I got paid. Like Dada gave him money to wear that brand. So I was like, oh, that's, that's cool, I'm glad you got paid for that. Soundscape, so again, when I'm talking to Frando this, this one day in Las Vegas in his boxing gym, I asked him, I was like, yo, it's so cool that you came into this song called No Me Se Rajar and that Vicente Fernandez sang the song for you in the arena, live. And he's like, nah, it wasn't Vicente Fernandez. Vicente Fernandez, for those that don't know, is like, when Chavez is the marker of like manhood for sports, Chente or Vicente Fernandez is like the marker of manhood when it comes to music. Like everybody hears his, his music and people go crazy at Mexican parties because they love him so much. And I'm like, that's cool that you got Chente to sing your song. He's like, no, actually, that was my friend. Samuel Hernandez was a friend of his who was looking to get into the music industry. And so he says, I told my friend Samuel, look, I got the biggest platform. I'm fighting Oscar De La Hoya in September 2002. Why don't you sing my song, my ring entrance song, and then that'll put you on the mat. And so his ring entrance speaks to this collectivity this lack, like selflessness, he, he puts his friend on. It's kind of like what Lil Wayne said in that one album, that one, that one album with uh, Talib Kweli's album where he says, you know, once you make it over the wall, your responsibility, your obligation is to reach over that wall, extend your arm and pull people over. And that's what Fernando Vargas does with his ring entrance. These are all the stories that don't get told in the buildup of a fight. Fashion politics. This is a journalist that I got to interview from the Sacramento Bee in California. He says, that entrance gives you a chance to make a statement before you get in the ring, and you can still make a statement in the ring. With boxing, you can wear your trunks to be a statement. Most sports don't have that freedom. LeBron can't change his jersey and put a jersey to protest anything. Boxing is very different from other sports because the boxer has the power to choose whatever they want to put on their trunks or on their robe. Many times it's brands because they get paid for having sponsorships on their trunks, which is another way that they make money. But some choose to put particular messages that speaks to who they are, like Lightning Rod Salka. Anybody know who Lightning Rod Salka is? <laughs> Nah, I, don't, I, didn't, I didn't really know who he was either, but I found out about this piece that I'm just gonna share with you right now, and I was like, fuck, I gotta know about this guy. <laughs> so this is, I study rebels of boxing. This dude is far from a rebel. Why is he far from a rebel? Anybody could tell me? Trump says America first. America first? What does that say to you? It's very patriotic. Do you see what these little things are? Is that a wall on his shorts? It's a wall. It's Donald Trump's wall. America first, the whole idea of make America great. So he's, a, he's aligning himself with Donald Trump, nativist, racist politics. And he's communicating that maybe to engage in psychological warfare with his opponent who happens to be a Mexican from Mexico City that goes by the name, which is perfect because Lightning Ross Salka is facing a boxer named Francisco Vargas and his moniker 
is the bandit, el bandido, which back in the back and back and back, back in the days, bandits were targets. Mexican bandits were oftentimes lynched because they represented a threat to the economic standing of California, of Texas, of Arizona. So bandits like Joaquin Murrieta would go out there and, and, and fight back. And so bandit has an important connotation in Mexican history. This is the only time I'll say that results matter. I don't really like to talk about the results, who won, who lost. If you notice, I didn't even tell you who won between Oscar De La Hoya and Fernando Vargas. Oscar won that fight, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> and this matters. This fight matters, who won? Lightning Rod Saga got knocked the fuck out. <laughs> America's first, the wall crumbled down. And it's not a big significant thing, like policy didn't change. Rod's probably still a Donald Trump supporter, and that's fine. But what happened here is the, the power of symbolism. Had Rod Salka won, we might see Donald Trump or just his supporters retweet that today America was first, along with all the politics that Donald Trump stands for. But in this situation, the results matter. Just like when Jack Johnson beat Tommy Burns to become the first heavyweight champion of the world, he didn't say he was about the black power movement, which wasn't going on at the time. He wasn't saying that he was trying to fight for racial justice, none of that stuff. He just knocked out white dudes in a time where that was a huge threat. And Rod Salka getting knocked out here, which I was very glad about, then symbolizes to an extent a form of resistance without having to say, I knocked them out because I stand for Mexicans and uh, I'm a bad hombre because I knocked this dude out, which he was a bad hombre in a good way though, I would say. So that's when results matter, the only time. Fashion politics, I draw a lot on, I don't know how much time, how are y'all you, doing? Good, tired, are we good? Just checking in real quick, y'all good? Con response, yes, good, no? Okay, we're good. Fashion politics. I draw a lot on scholarship that talks about the zoot suit. Because the zoot suit, made popular by Malcolm X and black folks, but also Chicanos during the World War II era, the whole idea of the zoot suit was a transgression. A lot of people used to talk about the zoot suit as being a attire that was un-American, that was not patriotic. Catherine Ramirez in this book called The Woman in the Zoot Suit. So what she did was dope because men are usually talked about as wearing the zoot suit. But in this case, it's like, what about the women who wore zoot suits? Up until that book, I was like, whoa, that's true. I didn't even know women wore zoot suits, but they did. And so she says, style is very important because there's this thing called style politics. And style politics, Catherine was referring to this expression of difference via style. And so by dressing a certain way, you either empower yourself to make a statement or you're rendered as something. And in the case of zoot suiters, they're rendered as unpatriotic just because of the bodies that were wearing them. So here in this case, Fernando Vargas is wearing this brand called Dada. And for those that don't know, Latrell, Sprewell, Chris Weber, these former basketball players used to be endorsed by, by Dada. But Dada was also this brand that in 1995, Mike Cherry and his associates started it with only $1,000 and it grew to a three or a multi-million dollar company in just three years. But it was also associated with urban problems, thug wear, to the point where like the school that I went to, in addition to banning Raider attire, in addition to banning Georgetown Hoyas attire because it was all considered gangster attire, Dada was banned from our school. We had to wear uniforms. And so Aida Hurtado, this scholar from Chicana Chicano Studies at UC Santa Barbara says that such fashion styles have been declared indicative of a social problem. Whether the youth wearing the attire in fact engage in problematic behavior or not. Which, which again, 
just because you're wearing the attire, it renders you a certain way. And so here we see Ferros with the name Ferocious, his son's names on his trunks, the Aztec calendar here, and then Dada Footwear, which was his sponsor in La Colonia, which is a community in Oxnard where he grew up. A community that has a gang injunction around it. And a gang injunction is basically when law enforcement identifies a region in a certain community that has a gang problem. And so by extension, when there's a gang problem and there's a gang injunction, oftentimes innocent bystanders get racially profiled for fitting the description, getting harassed by cops, getting not so much love. Soundscapes, this is one of my favorite fighters. Oh, let me rephrase. One of my favorite ring entrances. So I draw on Shauna Redmond from U University of California, Los Angeles, who is an ethnomusicologist. And she says, African sound franchises this concept where it's an organized melodic challenge that's utilized by African descendant to announce their collectivity and to what political ends they would be mobilized and organized. So music has the power to communicate politics and how people will be mobilized and organized. She enters the ring to this song called Ovarios. And the song says in one of its parts, Los ovarios que me cargo y grandotes. Ovarios is a Spanish word for ovaries. And it's kind of the equivalent of when men say, I got cajones, I got balls. And this is like a, a gendered approach to saying women are empowered. Women are powerful. And so when I talk to Maricela Cornejo, AKA La Diva, she says, this song is a representation of strong women. It's a strong female song. And she says, what I want to do is inspire people to just be themselves. Don't let anybody shame you for being a woman in a man's sport. That's what I want. I want to inspire women and any girl that comes up in this sport. Intentional messages. And oftentimes what I get when I interview boxers is short pauses and I think appreciation for the questions that I ask because oftentimes the media will ask, who are you fighting? Are you gonna win? How are you gonna defeat your opponent? What's the drama with you and XYZ Boxer? The typical scripts. And one of the things that I've been blessed with and it's a, it's a privilege is one time Jonathan Wally, who I mentioned earlier, texted me one time and I'll share this with you. I haven't ever shared this before, but he texted me one time. He's like, the questions that you asked me after I lost my first professional fight were therapeutic. They helped me process defeat. They helped me process struggle. And so for me, having these responses from these boxers that don't always get asked these questions is just, it's just a blessing. So entourage or community, this is a part that I'm still trying to figure out what the heck it means for boxers to enter with an entourage. Sugar Ray Robinson, a very popular boxer, one of the, the best boxers regarded as pound for pound, greatest ever to lace them up. He invented the idea of an entourage. Before him, nobody really entered the ring with their peoples. But Sugar Ray Robinson brought his whole community with him. And not just to the ring, but when he was seen in public, in bars, in restaurants, at parties, he would bring his boys with him. And so then this idea of an entourage in boxing, not a lot of people know, is credited to Sugar Ray Robinson, one of the best middleweights ever. And so to make sense of what's happening here in this ring entrance that Deontay Wilder from Tuscaloosa, Alabama orchestrates in Brooklyn, can be talked about in this concept that Benedict Arn Anderson describes as imagined communities. An imagined political community, he says, and imagined as both inherently limited and sovereign or free. It is imagined because the members of even the smallest nation will never know most of their fellow members, meet them or even hear of them. Yet in the minds of each lives the image of their communion. So in other words, if I'm a Dodger fan, there's millions of us. I maybe know like 0.0001% of those Dodger fans, but even the ones that I don't know, the commonality that we have is that we cheer for the same team. And to an extent here, Deontay Wilder from Tuscaloosa, Alabama is doing two things. He's reaching out through his entourage to a new fan base, which in boxing you need. If you don't have fans, if you don't sell, then the boxing industry is not gonna support you. 
So what he does is he enters with Lil' Kim. And Lil' Kim is from Bed-Stuy, a borough in Brooklyn, which is also the borough that Mike Tyson's from. And so being from Tuscaloosa, not the most known for boxing communities, takes his act to Brooklyn, draws on Lil' Kim, which she is the first woman to ever walk a boxer into the ring during a championship fight, and it's a heavyweight championship fight, breaking all kinds of barriers, and it's, it's history being made. But he's also teaching us of this idea of collaboration, of, of building bridges, of bringing the experiences, the historical experience of rural South Alabama to the, the struggles of the urban center, especially in the 1980s in Brooklyn when the crack epidemic had hit. And so he's bringing these bridges, he's bridging these two rural and urban communities together through his ring entrance by appealing to a fan base that's in Brooklyn by entering the ring with Lil' Kim. And so now people in Brooklyn see this marker of Brooklyn-ness, Lil' Kim, and they see Deontay Wilder, and their communion is this fighter. And so it's got capitalistic notions to it, but it also has this beautiful way of, 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 of bringing communities together. And again, Deontay might not say that, and it's not necessarily gonna be clear if he ever says that, but this, this is an interpretation that given the, this, the society, the historical moments, and the context that this is taking place, this is one powerful aspect that happens during this ring entrance. And so the final round, I just wanna talk about why this all matters in terms of like taking action and uh, this idea of mobilizing and organizing which are two very different things. What these athletes are doing, Colin Kaepernick, and this boxer that's photographed here, Jose Ramirez, they do a lot of mobilizing. And mobilizing means getting the masses, getting their attention, informing them about an issue that's happening, and that in itself is an important component because once you mobilize peoples, what follows is the organizing part, which is important. That's, that, that is something that, 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 that Dolores Bernal, the scholar from, from Los Angeles, talks about through these five dimensions of, of, of grassroots leadership, which is A, developing consciousness, which is basically informing people of the issue, holding office, which means having a position in leadership, in government, as a doctor, as an athlete in this situation, every role matters because those platforms can then help make a, make a difference. Organizing, attending meetings, getting people organized around the issues so that an ask is made of politicians, of school administrators, of local leaders, Networking, building a base of support. Athletes pulling people together through their mobilizing efforts like Kaepernick taking a knee gets people to start talking with each other about some of these issues when it comes to racial injustice and police brutality. And finally, a spokesperson, a person who can communicate the ask, can communicate the issues to the media, to the newspaper folks, Etc. And what Bernal tells us is that these are not hierarchical. Through a feminist lens, what Kaepernick is doing is just as important as what college students are doing on a college campus. And on top of that, it's the power of leveraging. If we know Colin Kaepernick is mobilizing people around police brutality and racism and racial justice, how can we use Kaepernick? Not as a tool, but as a tool for transformative change. A lot of people don't know this, but UCLA's women's soccer team has been taking a knee for the last two years. This is a key opportunity for those in Los Angeles from the Black Lives Matter movement to students on campus that are mobilized and organized on certain issues to collaborate with athletes. Because athletes have a very powerful platform, whether it's at a Division I school or a Division II school or a Division III school, those are the superheroes, those are the, the players on campus that have the attention and the influence of many on campus. And so what are folks doing to build bridges and to work together on common issues that folks believe in? 
This is Jose Ramirez, and I just took this photo this past weekend in Fresno when I went to his event. I'm interviewing him for a project I'm doing on, on boxing and rebellion, because he is the fighter that has been described as this era's Muhammad Ali. So going back to that question that I asked you, who's this era's, who has, has taken on the baton of Muhammad Ali in this era? And a lot of people are saying it's this guy. So I'm like, okay, let's, let's see what it's, what it's about. He came up with this, this hashtag, pro-immigrant and proud. And he wears these hats and he wears these shirts at all his press conferences and all his, uh, his, his ring entrances. And so part of this is mobilization. He's getting people to be aware of immigrants and anti-immigrant politics that a lot of conservative people have. And he's like, no, I'm from the Central Valley. My dad was a farm worker. I was a worker in the fields. And we need to address and take care of these workers. These are the three things that he uses his platform for him to, to raise awareness around. There's a big water issue in the Central Valley. And so he works with local farmers in his community to address this issue in Capitol Hill, in DC. Recently, I don't know if y'all know, but with all the detentions of children and their families, that really sparked something inside of Jose. And so now he's really taken on this pro-immigrant politic. And so that's why the hashtag, but he's also refashioned red hats. The red hats that read, make America great again, well, he changed that so it read pro-immigrants and proud. So he's doing the fashion politics stuff, but he's also working with folks who are writing legislation proposals for something, for example, called the DAPA program. DACA was Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, which didn't give undocumented people a path to citizenship, but it provided them with a temporary measure, which was a work permit to work legally here. But there was nothing for the parents. And so he's been working, he actually was gonna email me, he hasn't emailed me yet, so I gotta hit him up about that, but he was gonna email me the draft that they were gonna present in DC. That's organizing. And lastly, Fresno State Scholarship. He has this thing, this scholarship called the Jose Carlos Ramirez Scholarship at Fresno State University. This dude has raised, and he's only 26 years old, he's raised over $60,000. And this year was the first year, this fall, that a student was awarded the Jose Carlos Ramirez Scholarship. And he's particularly made it available for camp students. Camps, camps a program called the College Assistant Migrant Program for students who have a, a, a migrant worker background or parents that worked in the fields and farms and things like that in the Central Valley of California. And he himself was a former camp student in Fresno State. He dropped out though to pursue a boxing career. And now he's doing this, this scholarship as a way to give back and promote higher education. So boxer, boxers are talking. And despite the vulnerabilities and instabilities of the boxing market that I talked about earlier, this boxer is one of few who's taken the risk and doesn't care in the spirit of Fernando Vargas unapologetically using his platform and understanding that at any moment all this could be taken away. He's undefeated right now. If he loses, he might lose some steam and some, and some momentum. As long as he keeps winning, which I think is important, he'll be able to continue to do what he's doing. And boxing is just one part of what he does, according to what he tells me. And so these are these powerful platforms that athletes have, and they're also very well versed. It's just that they speak a different language, maybe, or they articulate it somewhat differently. But the lived experiences, some are very universal and some are very relatable to the justice issues that other people on college campuses and organizing circles are doing. And so there's just, what I'm trying to say here is basically there's opportunities to build bridges and work with folks who have these powerful platforms to make noise. So thank you so much, that's, that's it. I took this picture, I went to best Eye. What, don't leave yet. <laughs> I'm gonna tell you one more thing. I went to best Eye. I had to go check out the, the, the mural that they did in, in, in Mike Tyson's hometown. This is in best Eye. And a lot of people told me, don't go to best Eye. It's, it's, it's dangerous. And I said, that's where boxers are, so I gotta go there. I went to Mexico City to this place called Tepito. Tepito is this place that they say, if you go there, you're gonna get jacked for your cell phone, and then 20 minutes later, that same person's gonna try to resell you your own cell phone to you. That's how crazy it is. But we went there because a lot of people also don't know that Tepito is this breeding ground for boxers. In Mexico, some of the best champions have come out of this place that's also known for their informal market. And this slogan of Tepito existe porque resiste. Tepito exists because it resists. It's this place that was kind of left to fend for itself by the Mexican government, and it flourishes because the people have fought back. 
and boxers come from these communities. So what, what can we learn from them? So that's why I went there. And so this is my contact information, shameless plug, Boxing Intellect. You guys can follow me on Twitter and Instagram. And uh, if, if there's any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them as a group or one-on-one. Or -on -one. I'm, not, I'm not leaving anywhere, so, so I'll be here. Thank you so much. Thank you.